outside and get a breath of fresh air. I want fresh air, but not a thousand feet of it! <laughs> Hey, welcome to Scoobytopia. It's February as of upload, and I had this script already pretty well far off when I realized there would be no better time to go ahead and push it through for release so we can talk about a very special series this month. I think we've got a flat. Yeah, a flat tire and a flat basketball. Okay, let's fix the flat. But we've never fixed a flat before. So, we've never fixed a bridge before either. Gee, I never thought of it that way. <laughs> That's why I am your leader. I think of those things. <laughs> Over the years, Scooby-Doo has met a lot of iconic people and characters, especially on the series The New Scooby-Doo Movies. Cass Elliot was my favorite personally, which I've already discussed before, as well as a certain dynamic duo we'll be taking a look at real soon. But some of my top favorite episodes of the series were the Harlem Globetrotters episodes. Like many, I had the separate release Scooby-Doo meets the Harlem Globetrotters released on DVD and VHS in 2003 that contained two of the three crossover episodes and eventually, the best of DVD for the series. I don't know what it is exactly, but there's something so lovely about these three episodes in particular and I can never seem to get enough of them with zero sense of irony toward them. What is ironic is that I don't know a thing about sports, or who the Globetrotters actually are, or anything relevant here outside of Scooby. Watching sports anime is about as far as I go. With that said, let's sit back and look at the history and fun of when Scooby-Doo met the Harlem Globetrotters. <laughs> Harlem Globetrotters was a Hanna-Barbera series which premiered in 1970, a show that was fairly revolutionary at the time being the first Saturday morning cartoon series to feature a predominantly African-American cast as the leads. Filmation's The Hardy Boys and Hanna-Barbera's Josie and the Pussycats, another favorite of mine, would also feature African-American characters that same TV season. Like most Hanna-Barbera series, Globetrotters would run for 16 episodes during its run on CBS, getting a second season with six more before ultimately being cancelled. The series had a basic formula like Scooby, in which the team travels around, gets involved in something, one of them suggests having a basketball game to settle it, the weekly antagonist cheats to win, but eventually the team become overpowered and find a way to win anyway. Basically, think 1970s Kuroko's basketball. That's basically what it is. The team was made up of six real-life team members, although the real players wouldn't voice themselves here, which makes sense considering they weren't actors or adjacent like you'd want for a full cartoon. And at least, most of the actors were actually black. You've got legendary Scatman Crothers voicing Metal Art, for example, alongside Curly, Bobby Joe, Geese, Gip, and Pablo. Also joining the team was Granny, their coach, and Dribbles, the mascot dog, because after Scooby there had to be a dog. Scatman would actually come back to Hanover Bear to voice their number one super guy, Hong Kong Fui, four years later. I love that dog myself so if any fans are out there, please let me know. Unfortunately, unlike most Hanna-Barbera series, Globetrotters hasn't aired again since reruns on TV Land in 1999 ended, and has never been released on home video or streaming, so it's not available to watch anymore despite the significance. This comes down to it uniquely being owned by CBS and not Warner Brothers, who almost certainly would have put it out. Hanna-Barbera wouldn't be done with the Globetrotters yet, though, as in 1979, they made the series The Super Globetrotters. This time entirely produced by Hanna-Barbera, it would run on NBC for 13 episodes, and the team would actually now be undercover cover superheroes. Metal Art, Gip, Pablo, and Bobby Joe wouldn't return to the series following the ending of their careers in real life around the time, making Curly and Geese the only returning members, now joined by Twiggy Sanders, Nate Branch, and Sweet Lou Dunbar. Gaining their power from the Globetron, which also would weaken them upon secondary exposure, they each had a different superpower and could fly, receiving missions from a basketball-shaped satellite called the Crime Globe, voiced by Frank Welker. The formula basically remained the same, but with superpowers. So yet again, think Kuroko's Basketball. The good news for this series is that, being owned by Warner Brothers, it was released on DVD by Warner archive in 2014, yet again showing Warner certainly would have released the original. Not re-released unfortunately is the 1980 TV special sequel after that, The Harlem Globetrotters Meet Snow White. That's basically what it sounds like. The Globetrotters somehow find their way into a mix-up with fairy tale characters. Obviously, I took a look at the original series in particular in preparation for this video, and I found it to be really charming and enjoyable, just like their appearance on Scooby, which makes me all the more sad it's not legally possible to watch right now. It's pretty hard to even find good quality non-legal rips. I'd love for it to finally see at least a streaming release on Paramount Plus someday.
today, if nothing else. But it's what came between those two series that we're really here to talk about on the channel, right? For their appearance on the new Scooby-Doo movies, airing in 1972, a year after the final episode of their own show, the exact same designs and voice cast would be utilized, with the only change up being that Granny and Dribbles were dropped, although Dribbles did appear in the theme song with them for some reason. I assume they were dropped to streamline the cast, since the Globetrotters and Mystery Inc. make for a pretty cramped cast, and I imagine Dribbles being in the opening came down to reusing old animation from their show if I had to wager a guess. Having looked at the history that got us here, let's look at the three classic crossovers before the time on the clock runs out. Yippee! Hey gang! Stick around! We'll be right back with more laughs. Today, Scooby-Doo meets the Globetrotters! First up, the ghostly creep from the deep. This first episode picks up with Velma having delightful snark. Well guys, after checking our compass in the map, I've come to the conclusion... What's that, Velma? We are hopelessly lost. At one point, the fake laugh track ends up being so loud that you can't hear what Fred says. I just see <laughs> which in itself I think is incredibly funny, more so than the joke it was laughing at. Anyway, Daphne's woman's intuition confirms something is after them, and it turns out it's the Globetrotters on their bus. We find they too are lost and are following the gang to get out. Fred speeds up to lose them and crashes into the water. Clear up to our axles in mud. I thought he was going to say something else. Suddenly, Shaggy spots another ghost pirate ship, which we've had enough of on this channel lately, and before they can process it, what was chasing them catches up, unfortunately right into the mud as well. Everyone introduces themselves, but have to get out of there because of some nasty gators. There, they run into an old inn, which the boys refuse to check out, so Daphne tells them to yell if they see any ghosts, and out pops the ship again right on time. Shaggy tries to stop everyone, and Metal Art tries explaining why it's safe since ghosts don't exist, and they decide to head up. And hurry before the fog takes all the curl out of my hair. Me too! <laughs> the Globetrotters explain Dribbles and Granny are at his canine contest in Chicago, so they at least have an excuse for their absence this time. Velma chastises Metal Art for being superstitious about his ball, and the boys are spooked into going with him to get it when a ghostly voice tells them to leave, all while someone mysterious watches. The buses are safe, but the boys dive down to miss a bird and end up in a log, only to get scared by Metal Art and cat dog their way out, which then scares Metal Art into running, but now the boys recognize him and chase, and now he thinks he's being chased by the monster, and now the boys think they're being chased because because he's running. Meanwhile, the others can't find the source of the voice and decide to go inside finally when the creep from before warns them of Redbeard the Pirate's ghost. And no, this is not the same ghost of Redbeard the Pirate from the original series, or if it is, it's never stated. Yes, it's confusing. Metal Art finally makes it back, warning them of what's chasing him, and the boys come rolling in, plowing through everyone until crashing. And just as everyone starts to mourn, they pop out safe, but not sound. They finally make their way to the door, but it's locked, so they have to break it down. What a mess! Maybe we should have tried the back door. Maybe it doesn't have a back door. It does now. Also, this angle is not flattering. Suddenly, laughter that isn't the laugh track breaks out, though that won't shut up either, and I love Velma struggling to explain it here. Besides, that was just, well... A scary noise. I also love the faces. Lots of good ones this episode. They decide to run and we see the laugh is from the same creepy old guy who disappears into another room after celebrating his victory. As the gang get up again, I have to say Velma is consistently the funniest person here. I love her. Naturally. That's because there's nobody here to hear but ourselves. Metal Art gets the idea to drown out scary noises with a basketball game and Scooby is easily the MVP. What kind of basketball are you playing? Football. The Globetrotters show off, so the gang huddle to get their plan straight. Things seem to be going poorly when the boys go for the wrong basket, until the ball bounces back over to theirs and they're up 10 to 0. Of course, Metal Arc won't stand for that and evens it back out 10 to 10. The guys remember they have a game tomorrow though, so they decide to turn in for the night to rest. The creepy old guy watches as Redbeard pulls in, and to more confusion, he does look identical to the previous Redbeard, except this one is all white. Still not the same though, as far as I know. Meanwhile, everyone takes turns on guard duty until the creepy old guy pops in to warn them of the ghost. Even his two henchmen look identical identical to the other Redbeard's henchmen, but all white now. The mortals have them surrounded and start their fight, and they have the ghost beat, so Redbeard begins to summon the rest of his crew, which gets everyone to surrender. Uh, how does walk in the plank sound? Corny. I mean, it just isn't done in this day and age. My Daphne, what big eyes you have. As Velma asks why they don't disappear with the dawn, a helicopter suddenly flies by outside, and the ghosts quickly make an exit to avoid it using a smoke bomb. Curiously, however, Velma finds oil-covered footprints left behind. Scooby then picks up an interesting whiff until he and Shaggy fall through the floor and onto a getaway boat of the ghosts, and for better or worse, they don't notice. Velma does notice the pile of Scooby snacks and reveals the trap door, and out the window they see the situation the boys are in. They leave a trail of Scooby snacks for the others to follow, and speaking of, they head out, leaving nobody behind even if by accident. 
and they have to hurry as the trail is eaten by catfish, and not the MTV kind. The creepy old guy excitedly watches as the boat disappears through the swamp, and Scooby Sneeze startles the ghosts as they expose them. It seems the escape plan goes awry for the boys until they decide to bounce and get on the ship, but they're not safe as they try hiding again. Thinking the coast is clear, their exploring leads them back to Redbeard and his ghouls, so they make a break for it again, only to end up back where they started. The others see the remains of the snack bag near a gator when they hear Shaggy's voice ring out, and they reach the entrance where they try being quiet, but the creepy old guy seems to be warning the ghosts. As Shaggy threatens them with pulling a lever, it ends up revealing the ship's full pirate overlay instead. While the others enter, the tarp covering the entrance comes down with them and scares the ghosts, but after revealing themselves, Redbeard calls out his full crew. The creepy old guy is ecstatic to watch things continue as the fight gets intense. Like we have to do something! What? Oops! Like we didn't have to do this! With two ghosts taken out, Redbeard takes control of an unusually modern crane, but the Globetrotters swiftly make a switch so he captures his crew instead. It seems they're trapped as creepy old Swampy Pete whispers to the boys who start spraying oil everywhere in their fear, so everyone tries escaping to the barge until Redbeard threatens to unleash his ghostly friends again. Redbeard tells them to get below until they vanish, but Pete tells them to jump over and they realize they have no other choice but to trust him. But Shaggy and Scooby pull the lever once more, collapsing everything back and trapping the ghosts. Swampy Pete reveals the spirits were just mini projections the whole time, and the helicopter from before arrives full of police that Pete had on standby until he could find the ghostly crew. Turns out he's actually from the Harbor Patrol, and Redbeard is just some loser scaring people away while he taps the nearby oil wells. The Globetrotters are disappointed they're going to miss their game, but their new friend hooks them up with a ride to repay them, and they make it to their game, though some of these moves seem illegal. But I don't know sports, so who am I to judge? Maybe swinging through the air and forklifts are normal on the court. In one last twist, Scooby steals Shaggy's burger reward, making it safely up into the basket. <laughs> I would say this episode probably has the least interesting villains of the bunch, especially since they're just recycled in every way. But the jokes in this one are really funny, laugh out loud sometimes. It has great faces, and Swampy Pete having the additional twist of being a good guy is great. It's a solid fun Scooby time. This is the only episode of the three oddly not included on the Harlem Globetrotters solo DVD, so it might be the one audiences are less familiar with if that was the main resource for watching them, but it's still a fine time. Let's check out the following classic episode which was included on that set. Today, Scooby-Doo meets the Globetrotters! This time, it's the Loch Ness Mess. Now, we're going back to our roots to meet another Loch Ness Monster. Some people have asked why I didn't mention this episode in my Loch Ness Monster movie video, and truth is, in addition to the episode not taking place in Scotland, I was always planning to do this video in some form and wanted to save it, so let's finally talk about it, and be sure to watch that video if you haven't. This week, the gang is on the road from Boston, having seen artifacts from the likes of Paul Revere, you know, the usual Americana-obsessed nature the gang has in this time period. They're on their way to visit Shaggy's Uncle Nat, voiced by Lenny Weinrib, who was also the original voice of Scrappy as we've discussed on the channel before. Shaggy gets a whiff and we see it's the Globetrotter stopped to make some lunch. The gang pull over to talk since they're all best buddies now after last time, even being asked to join the lunch. While Shaggy tries to tell them about where they're headed, we get this cheeky moment from Scooby which I love. The animation in this show is rough, but often so expressive. Anyway, Shaggy offers the Globetrotters to come with them to Uncle Nathaniel's place, since they're looking for some quiet time and his home has like 75 rooms. Wouldn't that be nice? They drive off, and bubbling up from the surface, we see the titular Nessie knockoff finally appear. On the way, they switch things up with Shaggy driving the mystery machine, since he's the one who knows where his uncle lives, though Velma has to keep him in line. You can take a guess at what all the X markings are on his map. It's just about nightfall by the time Velma asks if they're lost, and it's just in time for a run-in with a ghost. Everyone stops to ask ask who he is, but he warns them strangers aren't welcome in these parts, and vanishes away bit by bit. This part was always creepy to me as a kid, honestly. Another ghost watches as Shaggy speeds off despite Fred's yells, which leads him into almost ramming into another spooky specter until he makes a mad turn. The others notice a warning sign that the bridge is out, but doubt Shaggy saw it. And what's more bizarre is Velma simply calls it quaint, but can't seem to read the giant sign saying that it's closed. Like, I would expect her to at least notice that above anything else. Shaggy can't stop in time, but they still somehow make it through safe anyway. Velma wonders why it was closed if it's so safe, and the others can't find a broken board, almost like the bridge is new. The builder himself reveals he only put up about half a year ago in fact, as the others recognize Uncle Nat at last. Shaggy introduces everybody, and Nat reveals he built the bridge to add local color and people used to love taking photos. He brings everyone inside to explain his story, including that he never put up that mysterious sign about it being closed, it just appeared one day. The Globetrotters do some special ball tricks to help Scooby and everyone calm their nerves until poor Uncle Nat goes flying and finally recognizes that the Globetrotters are, well, the famous ones. The spinning wheel goes flying next, and I don't know why Uncle Nat has one unless he's pulling some Maleficent business on the side, but poor Scooby takes the fall. The boys go exploring to calm their nerves and find a ton of pictures of old Roger's family relatives, though curiously not the, uh, confederate soldier he has in common with Scooby from Boo Brothers. We'll get to that someday. Great-great-grandmother Matilda at least is interesting. Notice the family characteristic? Oh, 
Yeah. Yeah. It's the nose. Noses run in our family. Noses run? <laughs> she didn't like that one, I see. They find a family album next, as this just becomes a Shaggy Family Tree video. And of course, Baby Norville had his face scruff even at three. At least Baby Scooby is perfect. Scooby gets scared by a dummy and immediately is ready for the new season of RuPaul's Drag Race, until another portrait moves. Shaggy tries to disprove it, but then the ears wiggle, so they decide to turn in. Of course, they can't sleep, so they grab a snack, only for Uncle Nat to reveal their soup is soap. Later that night, the ghost of a Paul Revere wannabe warns the British are coming, waking everyone up, and Fred and Velma are sure it's a joke by Uncle Nat. Unfortunately, they follow chattering sounds directly to him, his nephew, and his dog. Turns out that ghost has been doing this every night for weeks now. Fred, Shaggy, and Scooby draw straws for the first guard duty position, leaving Scooby alone, though Shaggy leaves him with a string to let him know of danger. I'm sure that won't go poorly. He does his best until tiring out and napping until a scary hand wakes him up, so he pulls Shaggy right out of bed to tell him, but it's just a tree shadow. Shaggy sends Scooby to get a snack while he keeps watch, but one of the spooks sneaks in to scare them and wakes the gang up. They try to hide and won't even let poor Shaggy go back for his sandwiches, but it does no good when they have to get out again. Getting separated and lost, Metal Art gets them into a secret passage that leads them right back to the ghost. Eventually, the boys find a laundry chute that just leads to Metal Art and Curly scaring the chickens before making their way to the kitchen where Nat has made breakfast for everyone, and tells them about all the fun to be had in the area. Before they go, Nat warns them of the Loch Ness Monster type sea serpent to look out for on top of the ghosts. You know something? I don't think I want to see a sea serpent. Relax, Curly. If you see a sea serpent, I'll see that you don't see what you thought you saw. See? Yeah, I think I see. They finally make it to their destination, a bit more rundown than expected, and the gentlemen outside are totally not shady and obviously the ghosts, so it's mighty suspicious they turn them down to rent boats, despite the sign. Uh, don't believe nothing you hear, but only half of what you read. Hey, that's good! Don't believe you're nothing, only half! Will you knock it off? Thelma and the others threaten to get the authorities involved, so the men apprehensively allow a couple of boats out. The other Globetrotters get to have some water skiing fun with the girls, while Metal Arc and Curly join Fred and the boys for diving, all while the men from before angrily watch it unfold and decide to get them out. Underwater, Scooby discovers a sunken ship and runs over through the water until the serpent appears, and somehow Metal Arc can talk underwater enough to warn them as they fly up and get out of there. Shaggy and Scooby try explaining how terrifying it was, but Scooby was a little too convincing. Nat reveals this is the first time it's ever appeared in the day, normally sticking to night like the ghosts which has led most people to move away. Uncle Nat's just stubborn. That's the Yankee spirit, Uncle Nat. Uh-huh. Scooby-Doo sure does love that lovely Americana imagery. He's been getting tempting offers from the guys we saw earlier, though, so Fred decides they need to go back to investigate any connection between the ghosts and serpent. Thelma brings up old Nessie in Scotland, as we've covered in depth before here, which Fred doesn't believe is any more real than this one. All right, all those stand, don't raise your hand. <laughs> Fred reminds the boys that the ghost will be coming tonight, so they agree to come as well, and they head out. The boys try to point out their terrible nighttime eyesight to get out of going farther, but Metal Arc traps them in and they head back with the same team that first saw the serpent. The B team staying behind at least try to have some fun while stuck, with the girls even becoming a makeshift basket until one trick pulls out the gruesome ghouls again. Everyone tries hiding in a cabin, but get themselves in more trouble. Meanwhile, the A team take a break to rest when Scooby thinks he sees something, but it's his reflection of course. Back on land, the girls get an idea to hide in boats, while the boys begin to wonder if they should give up just in time for the serpent to finally show and chase them. Scooby flies on top of it and ends up pulling out a plug, flying both into the air as it deflates and knocks into the ghosts, revealing of course the men from before. As Mr. Revere tries to escape, Curly gets a good shot at him and unmasks their boss behind it all. Inside his lantern is the control for the serpent, all to try and get treasure from that sunken ship that Scooby found earlier. Nat gets a good laugh out of this, because like with the old gator ghoul, the ship was fake as part of a movie set from 30 years prior, a meaningless abandoned artifact. As Shaggy boasts about how fearless he and his uncle are, Scooby still gets the last laugh. Well, I guess everyone does, collectively. And so ends another great episode with this cast. This was one that actually did give me some good spooks as a kid, so it gets some nice bonus points for that and the great atmosphere. Once we meet the guys at the boat rental place, it's pretty obvious who's behind this one, but the ghost designs are pretty spooky enough to get by. Uncle Nat is also a fun and memorable addition to the cast, even if he's never appeared again. Some pretty fun animation and faces also this time. With that said, let's check out the third and final time the gang met the famous Globetrotters, which oddly enough is yet again related to water. Not sure why that's the theme, but okay. Today, we meet the fabulous Globetrotters. For round three, we're on the mystery of Haunted Island. This time, the gang are on their way to Picnic Island, and speaking of Picnic, they realize Scooby is missing and somehow fit himself right in the basket of their food. And just as they're out of food, they're also out of gas. Luckily, there's an old shack they hope will have help, though it seems empty. I heard something, something. Something, something. Hey, 
Hey, that's a good tongue twister. Something, 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 something. Bet you can't say it five times fast. Thelma, the MVP of comedy yet again. People don't give her the credit. It seems the thumping is coming from below, and it turns out it's the Globetrotters practicing for their game tomorrow. The gang are spooked when they break through, and then the Globetrotters are suspicious that someone's here and it might be their rival team. Then neither side can open the door because they're both pulling, so both sides team up until they fly into a pile. Not to be gross, but which naughty artist decided to show Daphne's panties here? I'm so serious. Both sides reconnect and explain themselves, and the gang decide to invite the Globetrotters to come with them for the day to relax. Unfortunately, someone has other plans. The guys fill up the gang's tank and basket, which to Scooby's anger now will have a padlock, and they hit the road. As Velma hopes they aren't too late, the ferry to Picnic Island packs up and heads out, and mysterious hands swipe away the sign and place it in front of a death trap. I'm queen. Looks like an old tanker to me. It's just a rusty old tub. Maybe it's named for a rusty old queen. Everyone boards, including the Globetrotters with their bags of balls, and they soon realize the whole ship is empty and seems to be named the Haunted Island Queen. The boys try to negate women and children first, but go nowhere, and the haunted ship seems to trap them aboard as they set sail. As the boys prepare to jump, Metal Ark warns them of all the dangers, but it's too late for poor Scooby, though thankfully he can climb air. Metal Ark declares himself captain and promises to get them back safely and has everyone go investigate. Kip follows his orders to toss the anchor a little too well, and Bobby Joe definitely turns the wheel around. The gang below find the ship is fully in motion, and there even seem to be ghost hands steering it. It's time for all hands on deck. Except you two. Meanwhile, the boys raid the kitchen and run into more shenanigans from whoever's controlling this. After going over what they know, Metal Ark reveals a map showing they're headed to Haunted Island. But how can you be sure we're headed there? Call it Dead Reckoning. Dead Reckoning? Bobby Joe, what's our position? Our position? Uh... I'm hanging up here by one arm, and you and Curly are on the bridge. Geese has his head stuck in a porthole. Gip and Pat are falling down the stairs. And Shaggy and Scooby are hiding under a deck chair. I'm sorry I asked. And that's why these episodes are elite. Over at Haunted Island, we find two other ghost hands celebrating their victory as the ship pulls in and they prepare to crash, with the boys jumping with a hope and a prayer. Thelma, meanwhile, really finessed herself a quick ride. Good for her. Trying to find somewhere to stay, they spot another abandoned building and hope for the best. Say cheese, Scooby! <laughs> Rockford. They knock with the ball since lights are on and announce their entrance while searching for the room's lights. Why do they hang things like this on the wall? Because it's for decoration. Why don't they decorate the wall with pretty things? Like pictures of us? Everyone makes their way to find bedrooms, but a little friend sets his sights on Shaggy along with his bestie. Th th they grabbed us! Yeah, they grabbed us too. Cool, aren't they? They all split into their rooms with the Globetrotters and their own big one together while the house comes to life in the dark. The boys say their nightly prayers, but a spook still bothers them anyway while we get one of the best scenes. First, as the Globetrotters pile into one bed, they each try saying goodnight to all the others one by one in reverence to the Waltons, then start scratching each other's feet until realizing one's got very cold feet and long toenails, until eventually putting two and two together and jumping out. Poor Curly gets tricked per usual into checking the bed, and the night armor jumps out and attacks. They dive in and attack back, but find Curly in the armor now and nobody else and the bed collapses into a trap door, though thankfully they sleep with, well, their balls. All the bumps in the night, meanwhile, keep the boys wide awake when they start seeing real spooks around every corner until they finally make a wrong move and fall through another trap door to the outside. The remainder of the gang come to see what the noise was and find the empty rooms, while the Globetrotters explore the library they're trapped in. Books covered in a weird glow fly at them, so they start looking for one with a way out. The boys outside can't seem to be heard from there, so Scooby lifts Shaggy to a balcony, but becomes dangerous when he can't stop shaking from seeing a ghost. Look down here at the corner of the screen and you can see some animation notes we aren't supposed to see get left in. Shaggy starts to lift again, only to realize it's not his ride and falls down a tree where he meets his spooked friend. Thelma finds Luminous footprints, while the Globetrotters have torn off every book while still finding no trapdoor trigger, but they do find Luminous handprints. After correcting the stop clock they lead to, it opens a trap door with a way out finally, and they start crawling while the boys outside try to leap only for a tree to ruin their plans. They tumble right into the Globetrotters on their way out as the gang follow the footprints to the same place, leading Metalark and Fred to check in the bush, 
bump heads, and finally we convene. They hear more noises and realize the hands and feet responsible are passing by to enter an old shack as they materialize into full people and enter. Trying to get in quietly, Scooby ends up clogging the chimney and smoking the ghosts out. Of course, the rival team's people are behind this, trying to make sure they'll be too tired for the game tomorrow. Inside, they find luminous paint, wires, and all the other trickery. And as Dawn approaches, they find the plan worked. The following night, the Globetrotters are passed out on the bench and don't even wake up on the court. They of course end up sleeping through the entire first half, but Shaggy has a plan. He starts covering them with ice, and suddenly they're wide awake. They just have to keep dropping ice down each other's pants for the rest of the night to keep it up. They do their best on repeat for the rest of the game until the deciding shot, and fate falls into Curly's snores, one finally being so big it pulls it and the basket right down to win the game. They thank the gang and call over some hot dogs for a snack, but there don't seem to be any left, of course. Hey sir, where did your body go? Anyway, so ends the final episode of the trilogy, which is just as lovely to re-experience as always. Still has some great atmosphere and probably some of the funniest moments of any of them. There isn't really one singular antagonist or spook to remember in this episode though with how impressively wide the scam was, so it does lose points for that aspect I suppose. The white robe look upon reveal also just isn't memorable or very detailed. Loch Ness Mess probably has the most memorable ones of the set, yet despite that it's still one of the best of the batch, so it's no wonder it was one included on the solo release. It might be one of the funniest episodes in general, IMO. With that said, let's pack it up now that we've reached the end of this journey. Don't go away! We'll be back in a moment with more exciting fun! Having revisited these classic episodes for this today, I still can safely say that these are three of my favorite Scooby-Doo episodes easily. They're really funny, have great atmosphere, and the Globetrotters are just fun characters to spend time with. It makes it all the more sad that their main series has become a bit lost to time outside illegal uploads of TV Land rips, because from what I've seen of it, I believe I would have a great time even with the little I know of basketball. I never got the chance to grow up with it because those reruns stopped by the time I was like three. Viacom, Paramount Plus, etc. I know you have your team clearly watching this video because they have nothing better to do. So let's get the 1970s series Harlem Globetrotters on DVD or streaming yesterday. If there's legal things to work out, send me some lawyers and I'll do the work. Whatever we have to do. I hope this white juice fly works. It always works in the movies. You're a real comfort. Now put this on Curly, you'll be the nurse. But why do I have to be the nurse? Now wouldn't I look silly as the nurse? Yeah, you are right. But I still don't want to be the nurse. But just think, Curly, you'll be the star of this great escape. I will? Here, take a look at yourself in this mirror. Is that not the picture of a star? Hey, I look just like that nurse on TV. I'll do it, Mel I'll do it. I knew you would, Curly, baby. How do you guys feel? Did you have the opportunity to grow up with that series? And or did you get to grow up with these classic Scooby crossover episodes with it? How do you feel about how they hold up? I know I really love getting to stop and enjoy some old favorites for a minute here instead of the modern eras only again. Next time, at least I assume, we'll be taking a look at some more new Scooby-Doo movies episodes, but with a twist as we dive into the worlds of comics, television, and film as well for this coming subject. I started writing that episode last year like this one, so it's already well structured, but it's going to be one of the deepest dives yet like Dynamon, so it might be a while before it's here. I did do a video in January that I liked a lot, but it was so controversial that I couldn't make it a wide release and had to have it only go to people with notifications turned on. And even with that, analytics say at least six people were so upset that they unsubscribed over it, so it will forever have to remain a secret special bonus for those who know where to find it. If you don't want to miss the next special deep dive, which will be a wide release, make sure you're subscribed, like this video if you want to bless me, follow me on social medias where I'm more active if you want, etc. I guess I'll see you all when the next one is done, whenever that is. Bye! Oh yeah, of course it's only a flag.